Our first speaker is Byron Eckerd. Uh, Byron is, uh, lives just up the river in Halifax, and he's been ice fishing the lakes of central Pennsylvania for more than 30 years. In addition to being an avid ice angler, Byron operates the Northeast Ice Tour, a series of professional level tournaments held throughout the northeastern United States. Byron is also a pro staffer for Jiffy Ice Drills and publishes the Northeast Ice Fisherman. Byron, if you can come up. Our second speaker is Bob Griffith. Bob uh, is a resident of Vandergrift, just up the river from Pittsburgh, and has been fishing since he was uh, six years old. He extended his open water season to include ice fishing in 1992 and fell in love with the sport. He quickly progressed from pure fun fishing to successfully competing in tournaments for the last eight years. He has fished from Vermont to Minnesota, from Lake Erie to Maryland. He and his partner, Mike, have had multiple top ten placements in tournaments as well as two first place wins. They topped the points race to be named the team of the year in 2010 in the Northeast Ice Tour. Bob is a pro staffer for Clam Corporation, Mackie Plastics, and Jason Mitchell Fishing Rods, and Charlie Brewer Slider Grubs. And finally, Mike Kuna. Mike resides in Pittsburgh, uh, the home of the seven-time Super Bowl winning champion Pittsburgh Steelers, uh, and has been an avid ice fisherman for seven years. Along with his cousin Bob and his fishing partner, Mike has fished in ice fishing tournaments throughout the ice belt uh, and the, throughout the Northeast. As a team, Mike and Bob have won ice fishing tournaments and are in our current anglers of the year for the Northeast Ice Fishing Tour. Mike is a pro staffer for Clam Corporation, Maki Plastics, Jason Mitchell Fishing Rods, and Charlie, Charlie Brewer Slider, Slider Grubs. And Mike and Bob are also co-founders of the Keystone Crappy Association. So please join me in welcoming uh, Byron, Bob, and Mike. And uh, I'm looking forward to an exciting program. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Uh, first thing, John, I'm sorry your slide got lost. I wanted to see your pictures of your fish. Maybe next year. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is thank you guys for all coming out today. Hear us talk a little bit about ice fishing uh, here in Pennsylvania. Uh, I'd like to thank the Fish Commission for having us. Uh, it's a big deal for us to be here with the Fish Commission doing this program. There's three things I always like to point out when I start doing these programs. The first thing is that we are fishermen. We are not professional speakers. So if I'm stumbling and I look like I'm lost, just bear with me. I'll find myself. Uh, the second thing is that we only have a limited amount of time here tonight. I'm sure that the three of us could do a 10-hour seminar on ice fishing. So, you know, a lot of things we're going to sort of breeze over and let you learn on your own. Uh, hopefully we'll touch some things on it give you some ideas, hopefully help you catch some more fish. Third thing I always point out is that nothing that we do or say here tonight is written in stone. There's always exceptions. You know, somebody will send me an email a month later and say, well, I did it the exact opposite way, and yes, that's true. Uh, we're going to go over some of the basics here. Let me... One of the great things about ice fishing is that it's really an affordable sport to get into. How many, how many of you guys here have been ice fishing, have never ice fished or have been doing it for less than a year? Okay, great, great. One of the great things about ice fishing, as I was saying, is it's affordable. It really is. I mean, you, I'm going to say if you already have a fishing license, probably for about $120, you can go out and get involved in the sport and get what you need to get started. Uh, we call it a paycheck sport because you can get started on a paycheck. Uh, and as John mentioned, one of the things I do is I run the Northeast Ice Tour Tournament Series. And one of the great things about doing that is that I'm always surrounded by really good fishermen, guys that are much better than myself. Uh, Mike and Bob are two of those fishermen. Uh, they took our Angler of the Year honors last year. They also won our first tournament this year on Beechwood Lake in Ty Tioga County last week. They took first place there. Uh, so they're already on a mission to get Angler of the Year honors again this year. And now I believe we will turn it over to Bob. Thank you, Byron. 
Uh, to start off, we're going to talk eye safety. We'd be remiss not to talk about, especially for the beginners here. Um, four inch minimum ice thickness to travel out onto uh, that should support one individual and his gear or her gear. Uh, black ice is clear ice. That is the strongest ice that you can go out onto. Um, you should never go out by yourself. You should not um, ever be alone out on first and last ice because ice thickness is uneven, uneven moving water. Ice is thinner in those areas. Um, again, white ice is less thick or less strong. Okay, before you go out onto the ice, you should check with local bait shops, online reports. Uh, the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission uh, has reports on their site regarding ice thicknesses. The DCNR has reports regarding ice thicknesses for the state parks, the state lakes. Uh, regarding the DCNR, their, their reports are generally conservative, but be assured that what they post is safe ice conditions. So you should travel out there and, uh, and see. Do your homework. You know, before you get all gun ho to get out onto the ice, you know, travel cautiously. Take, take uh, an auger out, a spud bar with you to uh, check the ice. Spud bar, save your life. If you use this first and last ice. When you travel, hit the ice, let it thump, you know, but strike it hard. Beware of snow patches on the ice, especially at first ice. When the snow patches, when the snow falls and you get these little patches of ice or snow on top of the ice, the ice or the snow insulates the ice. So, again, contributing to the uneven growth of the ice. Spud bar is a great tool, an example of the snow patches and the spud bar. When we were in Michigan, we heard rumor of staying off the snow patches on the ice. And if you looked around, there was paths basically of ice in between the snow patches. They told you to stay on that. So we did. After all day fishing, we were coming off the ice, it was getting dark, uh, we ran into a fisherman coming onto the ice. And he says, I noticed you guys are fishing and just traveling all over the place, crossing these snow patches. He says, I want to show you something. He takes this snow, the spud bar here, and we're standing on the, the ice. And he thumps the ice real hard, doesn't break. He just reaches an arm length over, one shot, and the spud bar went through. Mike and I were traveling on those snow patches all day. We were very fortunate. All right, enough about the spud bar. Have one at the beginning of the season and at the end of the season. If you're going to venture out onto the ice, early ice and late ice, wear a life preserver. You don't have to wear... A bulky one like this, you could use a uh, inflatable one that just kind of wraps around your neck and straps it to waist. Carry 50 foot of rope for you to self-rescue and or to help rescue somebody else. Uh, the reason for the length, you don't want to get close to somebody who has gone through. So you kind of want to just throw the rope to them, anchor yourself up. First ice is bare ice typically, so you want to wear a good pair of cleats. As Byron mentioned about uh, affordability, you can get a good set or an affordable set of cleats for five bucks, a little less if you catch them on sale, or you can go big time, $30 for this uh, yak track, which covers the whole foot of the of the boot gives you a wider grip on the ice. If for any reason you would happen to fall on the ice, have a change of clothes in your
your vehicle so you can change into warm, dry clothes because uh, somebody like that might be wanting to see you home at the end of it. And the best tool of all, your head. Don't venture out onto thin ice. Okay? And then for self-rescue, awls. These are used to dig into the ice to help pull yourself out. With new awls like this that fit together, one of the things you want to make sure, wear them out a little bit so they slip apart easily. Read reports online of guys falling through brand new ice awls that they never used. Couldn't get them apart. It was fortunate they were in water that, that was manageable, but the fact was they could not get themselves out of the water. These were stuck, and the colder you get, the less your hands work and your ability to manipulate small or tight things. So make sure you stretch them out a little bit, work them back and forth, get them loose before you venture out onto the ice. And now I will turn it over I think I'm off the ball. to Byron. Yes. yes. Since you were nice enough, to, nice enough to talk a little bit about safety, I'm going to talk about something that sort of relates to safety and is the first thing you got to do once you're safely out in the ice, and that is cutting a hole in the ice. A uh, couple ways you do not want to cut a hole in the ice. An axe, a chainsaw. Okay. It's just, it's not safe. It's just not a good idea. Uh, the proper way to cut a hole in the ice is with an auger. Hand auger here, prime example. Uh, you can get you can get a hand auger for a new one. I guess sixty bucks or so for a decent one. Avoid the temptation to buy one used. You never know how it's been treated. If you buy a new one, always keep the blade protectors on the blades. You can see on the end of this, on the end of this auger here, there's a plastic cup on there, protects the blades. Uh, first of all, it keeps you from cutting yourself, but you'll get a lot more life out of your auger. You throw it in the back of your pickup truck, one little nick on those blades that you can't even see, and it's never going to cut right again. So blades are important. Like I said, if you're going out to buy your first one, buy a new one. It'll last you 10 years. Avoid the temptation of the one at the yard sale for $5 because you'll go out and you'll end up hating ice fishing. Uh, a spud bar, as Bob was talking about, very easily be used early in the season. When I go out early in the season, I have less than about six inches. I use my spud bar almost exclusively. Chop a hole in the ice. Uh, if you're buying a hand auger, get a six inch bit. Okay, just like running a drill through wood, the smaller the bit, the easier it's going to be to cut a hole in the ice. Get yourself an eight inch auger through a foot of ice with a hand auger, it'll just wear you out. Uh, in my mind, there's no need at all for a 10-inch auger anywhere, whether it's a power auger or not. If you're going to get a power auger, power augers are really nice. Uh, this is a Jiffy. This is one of the new propane models. First, and you know you should drill some more holes and move around, try to find some more fish. Power auger gives you a little bit more incentive than going out and drilling some more holes by hand. Uh, like I said, this is one of the new ones. Right, right up. There you go. That's got to teach you to get. Uh, again, blade protector always on. Am I going to say anything on cutting a hole in the ice? I don't think so. Uh, but like I said, stay away from that axe, that hatchet, chainsaw. And like I said, if you're buying a hand auger, six inch bit, you're gonna get a power auger, go with an eight inch bit. Okay, now the hole's drilled, it's time to start fishing. Uh, Bob and I are almost exclusively pan fish fishermen. That's what we fish for on the tournament circuits uh, that we fish. And the method that we use for fishing for these panfish is jigging. Now, jigging is a vertical presentation 
It's used to attract fish and entice them to bite. The type of fish that you're after will guide you on the type of fishing rod that you'll need to use for jigging. Now, the types of fishing rod that we use are noodle rods, which have a very soft tip, ultralights or medium lights. Uh, we, we usually don't go any heavier than that because, like I said, we're, we're after panfish. Uh, one of the traits we look for in a rod such as this. Can you hear me without the microphone? It's just tough to work with it. It's a big tip. You can, see, you can see the two colors on there. It's very, very bad. So You want a very soft tip so that you can detect you know, real, uh, real light, minute bites. But you also want a good backbone to the rod. See how the, the tip is very flexible. I just have it bound a little bit here, and you can see how flexible that tip is. But there's a lot of backbone on there. So that's a couple of the traits that you want to look for on a, uh, on a jigging rod. Now, it was mentioned earlier that ice fishing is a fairly cheap sport to get involved in. This is an ice fishing combo that I use a lot. The rod costs $8, uh, the reel maybe $4, the line uh, 4 or $5, and the jig maybe another $3. And you got an ice fishing combo right here. So it's less than $20 right here. And like I said, I, I use this a lot. It's not just something that I show. I actually use it. Uh, <clears throat> now, this, this is a cheap setup, like I said. So the reel, you really can't. There's no bail to open to let the line out. So what, the way you use this is you just pull it out, and you work the jig down. It's usually used in shallower water because, it, because of how you need to use it. But I just work it down like that. Uh, the nice thing about this kind of uh, spool on the reel is that it's big. So you're not going to have line twist like you do on a smaller spool. So when you drop the jig down there, it's going to, there'll be less memory in the line to where your jig will kind of stay straight up and down. It won't be spinning down there. Uh, the other end of the spectrum is this type of setup that I have here. This is a St. Croix Legend Rod and a Shimano Sedona Reel. Now this combination costs about $100. The rod is $50 and the reel is about $50. Nice thing about this is that it's a very sensitive spring bobber, which is tough to see. Um, but you can see that that is very sensitive. I have a small jig on there and you can see that it's bending that, that spring bobber. The spring bobber is adjustable. You can slide it in and out with this little rubber grommet to make it more or less sensitive. Um, and the rod has a lot of backbone to it. And this type of reel has a very good drag system on it. It works very well in cold weather. It's a Sedona 500, like I mentioned. I've never had any issues with it. We've been out in some pretty cold temperatures fishing all day. I've never had issues with the drag system. Now, speaking of the drag system, you want to make sure that you have a reel that has a good drag system on it. Uh, the worst thing that can happen is you hook into a nice fish, and if the drag isn't there to help fight that fish, you're going to lose it because we use lighter line. Uh, usually two, the most the heaviest I use is four pound test, usually two pound test. Um, a couple advantages to that is the water under the ice tends to be clear because you don't have the wind moving the water around. Uh, the water is kind of stable, so the sediment and stuff kind of settles, so it clears up the water. And the thinner diameter is tough, tougher for the fish to see. So you know when they see the presentation, they don't see that. That thick line there that kind of looks out of the ordinary. Uh, another good thing about this type of system is if you do happen to have a bass or a walleye or a pike come, and they do come and take these little tiny jigs that we use sometimes, you have a fighting chance of getting it in. We've caught some decent fish on setups like this. So um, it's important to have a good, good reel. 
And just like anything else, you get what you pay for. This is a very good setup, and I use it a lot. Okay, um, now baits. Baits, we use uh, live baits occasionally. Wax worms, maggots, or a better name for maggots, or spikes. We call them spikes because it sounds a little better. Uh, but plastics have really, really evolved in the ice fishing world. Um, they're made in all shapes and colors and sizes. You can see some of them here, some of the colors and sizes and shapes. I know it's hard to see from where you're at, but um, just about anything you, you look for, you can find. Uh, any color you want, any shape you want. And sometimes the oddest colors work, like, you know, like a pink or even this, this light blue or fluorescent orange. Sometimes, for some reason, on a given day, the, the fish will just uh, tear those up, and that's what they want. Um, and even, there are even glow colors. Like, I don't know why I'm showing these. These are, these are so small they're hard to see, but this will actually glow in the dark. Like if you look at it in the dark, it'll glow green, and sometimes they're just, uh, the fish are beyond fire with those. Uh, when we fish in tournaments, we fish almost exclusively with plastics now. Um, so how, how do we want to fish these plastics? They're made to, to mimic live bait, and sometimes it just takes a little slight twitch. That's you know, where you're holding the rod, and it's because of that spring bobber, it's hard to hold still. That's, sometimes that's all the action that you need to get that to work. Uh, so, what, so what do we put the, the bait on? Do you just tie a hook on and put live bait on there. Sometimes that works, but we prefer to use jigs. Uh, jigs, just like plastics, come in all shapes, colors, sizes, um, including glow. You can get jigs that are, in glow, that are glow. And I don't know if you've heard this before, but a lot of times it's said that uh, a lot of jigs are designed to attract fishermen, not fish. You can see I have this case full on both sides, and I'll bet you 10% have been used. The rest just look pretty. So, I mean, it's it's basically a collection. Not that I won't ever use them, but, you know, it's just, it is what it is. Um, jigs are, are made from different materials now, too. They're not just made from lead. They, they've come out with tungsten jigs. And the advantage to that is you have a better size to weight ratio. So if you need, if you find that the fish are being finicky and they want a smaller bait, a smaller jig, you can put a smaller jig on and with that heavier weight get it down to where the fish are faster. And during tournaments time is a very critical element. You need to catch the fish while they're biting and as, as quick as you can. Uh, spoons are another type of lure. That are used, that's used for jigging for panfish. They present a little bigger profile and more flash and dance and sometimes that'll bring the fish in uh, and, and get them to bite. Swimmers, uh, they're like a jigging rapala. Uh, they're used, uh, they have a unique motion to them when you, what you want to do is you drop them down and you snap the rod up and that causes the jig to actually swim. If you see it, it has like a uh, <coughs> plastic tail on it. And when you, when you rip it up, it causes it to actually swim almost in a circle. And there's just different motions that you want to use depending on the type of lure you're using. Uh, since we, we fish for panfish mostly, we use smaller jigs. And colors can go from light to dark to natural colors. You just have to, to keep trying until you find out what's going to work. One of the most important aspects is the motion that you use when you're jigging. Um, a piece of equipment that we've really come to rely on is the spring bobber in recent years. Um, 
even when jigging, because you can see if I move that rod, that spring bobber kind of it subdues the motion. It's not like the, if the string was coming right off the end of the rod, your jig would go just as the rod tip does. But since that spring bobber is so sensitive, it kind of subdues that motion and makes it more fluid, so it's not jerky going up and down like that. So that's one of the advantages of using a spring bobber. Uh, another advantage is that bobber indicates it's a strike indicator. So how do you use it? Should it be straight up like that or like I have it at an angle? And the answer is at an angle because you get bluegill or perch, they'll, they'll grab your jig and you'll see the you'll see the spring bobber go down. But a crappie, they'll feed up. They'll come up under your jig and grab it and lift, and all of a sudden your spring bobber is now straight. It's not bent anymore. So that tells you that something's changed. And sometimes the bite is just that subtle where you'll see it and that spring bobber will just barely move. I mean, the bigger fish, the bigger bluegill, perch, crappie got big for a reason. They're not going to grab everything that comes down there, and they're not going to... Um, just jerk it because they, they've learned that um, if something looks out of the ordinary, that uh, you know, it's probably not a good thing. So that's how they got to be big. Uh, now you have the rod and reel in line tied on. So now what do you do? You just drop your jig to the bottom, lift it up, and start jigging. You don't want to do that. You got to keep in mind that the fish can be anywhere in the water column, from the bottom of the ice all the way to the bottom. So you don't want to just drop to the bottom, lift up, and start jigging. You want to make sure that you use that water column. So what's the best motion for catching fish? You know, is it a just holding that rod and giving it a slight twitch? Is it a fast jigging motion, raising and lowering? Is it an erratic motion where you, you sort of don't do anything with a rhythm, you just kind of have your, your bait dancing around? The answer is yes to all the above. Um, the circumstances will dictate the motion that you use or the combination of motions that you use. Uh, clear water, you might want to jig a little slower because the fish can see farther and it doesn't take that much to attract them. Water that's more stained, you may want to jig more aggressively because that not only causes flash, but it sends out vibrations and fish can sense that and it'll bring them in to investigate. Uh, what should dictate how you jig is the reaction of the fish to your presentation. If you're jigging and see fish on your electronics, which we'll talk about in a little bit here, and you see them coming up to your, to your bait and maybe they're not biting, that means you're doing something right. Okay, if you have one fish come up and look and swim away, don't think, okay, I gotta change things. But if you've been at it for a while, had several fish come up and look but not bite, then you need to tweak your presentation. Either if you're jigging slow, maybe speed it up a little bit. If you're jigging fast, slow it down a little bit. Um, even, even something like raising it up maybe a foot higher and doing the same motion that you were doing Will, will trigger a strike. So you gotta, you got to be ready to change things up. Whether it's uh, the size of your bait, the color of your bait, the motion that you're using, you have to keep all those things in mind and just try your best to change things up and see what you can do to entice that bite or cause that reaction bite. Um, <clears throat> and going back to like I mentioned about the jigs and plastics, don't be afraid to change the body style or the color. Uh, sometimes you have to downsize to catch fish. Sometimes you have to upsize to catch fish. Uh, whatever you do, when you're changing your motion, one thing you want to avoid is to stop your jigging motion for a long period of time. You want to keep it moving because if you stop for too long because of line twist, your, your jig will start to spin in circles and that's not a natural motion at all and, and the fish will pick up on that and kind of back away from from your bait because it uh, 
they can sense something just isn't right. So even if it's just a little twitch, you still want to keep it going. That'll keep your, your jig from spinning in a circle. So we were talking about panfish and jigging. Um, if you want to, to go for bigger, bigger fish, there's other equipment that can be used for that. And uh, one of the best pieces of equipment is a tip-up. Which Byron's already the top 10 finishers were all using plastics. Uh, there's a company called Mackey, M-A-K-I, Plastics. And they have a pretty good website with some video clips on there of a good way to fish little plastic baits where you can actually see how you should be jigging them, which we really can't do under these circumstances, but it's, it's a good video watch. When it comes to tip-ups, there's basically three different kinds of tip-ups. There's an X style here. This is a modified H style there. And this is a thermal hole cover style tip-up, often called a round or a disc tip-up. Uh, these guys enjoy pan fishing. I enjoy pan fishing too, but I also like fishing for big fish. We call them toothy critters. Nothing against the pan fish, but I like pike, I like walleyes, I like bass, uh, catfish sometimes. And there you're better off using a tip-up. Uh, I think if you're using tip-ups for panfish, you're doing it all wrong. Because you're going to catch a lot more panfish if that's what you're trying to catch by jigging as these guys have talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, I see some guys out there, they put a little wax room under a tip-up and they're running there every two minutes because their flag's popping up and they're catching little bluegills like this. You're going to catch a lot more panfish if you learn how to jig properly. Uh, my bait on a tip-up is almost always a minnow, preferably big. I, I like big bait. Uh, I like the round style, like I said. This is one. This is a fray bill. It's sort of old and beat up. is why the fly doesn't stick straight up the way it's supposed to. But in a nutshell, a tip-up is basically a remote fishing device. Here in Pennsylvania, we're allowed five fishing devices, price fishing. So a lot of times what guys will do is they'll set four of these out, spread them out in an area that they can cover, and then they'll sit and jig with a rod. Uh, I generally rig a tip up, 20 to 30 pound test, braided dacra line. That's that black line coming down here. It's much easier to deal with on the ice than monofilament line. That braided dacra line, sometimes it's called tip up line if you go to the store to buy it. That's attached to a swivel and coming off the swivel, you can see it there I have my monofilament leader. That leader is very short. Normally I run about a two foot monofilament leader. If I'm fishing for walleyes, I'll go as light as six pound test during the day, go up to eight pound test at night. Northern pike, I'll use 40 pound test monofilament. Some guys like a wire leader, I prefer the 40 pound test monofilament. I've never had any problems with that. Uh, Basically, the way the tip-up works is on the leader here, I have a split shot on there. I want the split shot to be big enough to keep my minnow bait down there, but no more than that. You don't want a whole bunch of weight there. Fish might, you know, walleye comes up and heals your minnow, starts to swim away. He feels a bunch of resistance because you have a big heavy sinker on there. He might drop it. Uh, my hook that I took off of here because I learned that if I leave the hook on here, I will hook the carpet for sure. Uh, but the hook is almost always a treble hook, okay? The size depends, but usually somewhere around an eight or a six. Uh, there's no need to go really large on it. And I'm hooking my minnow right under the dorsal fit, okay? You gotta, if you go too deep down into the minnow, you're gonna hit its backbone, it's gonna paralyze it. Most of the time, that's not good. One exception to that is when you're fishing from northern pike, a lot of times we actually like dead minnows. Catch them in the summer. Catch go out your local trout stream and catch some of those creek chubs that are fall fish. They're a good 10, 10 inches long or so. Throw them in the freezer. You just hook them the same way we hook a live one and just suspend them under the ice. For some reason, northern pike really like a dead bait. When you tip up the top of the ice here, and your fish comes up and he heals your bait, starts to swim off, that fly pops up like that. This free spool is going to be free to swim away with your bait.
one of the things I really like to do, I'm not going to say I'm real good at it, but I enjoy it, is I like, I like fishing for walleyes in Pennsylvania because they're very challenging. Uh, and if you want to catch a walleye through the ice in Pennsylvania, your very best bet is the last hour of daylight until about midnight. They, just, they bite a lot better after dark. Uh, and I have this nifty little alarm that goes on here. And I'm going to say there's a 50% chance this will work since I'm in front of a bunch of people. <laughs> but when you get a five, it goes like that. <laughs> You'll hear that in the dark. <laughs> so will everybody else. Uh, a, couple, a couple things with tip-ups is, you know, 30 years ago we were taught to you drop your bait to the bottom, you lifted a foot off the bottom. That's what people do. To this day, I see that's what people do. They set out five tip-ups, every one of them is a foot off the bottom. Okay, fish cruise the entire water column. Now some fish, walleyes during the day, will be right on the bottom. But as soon as it starts to get dark, they're going to come up off that bottom. You know, I've caught a lot of walleyes where I've been in 20 foot of water and my bait's been down eight feet. They'll come up off that bottom pretty high. Uh, Northern pike are the same way. You know, so I generally put some of my baits right on the bottom, but I also try to keep some up off the bottom. Now, if all of a sudden I start getting flags on all the tip-ups where the bait's right on the bottom, then I'll go over and adjust the other one so it's right on the bottom. But to start off, if you're, if you're running four of these out there, or five of these, and every time your bait's a foot off the bottom, you know, you're, you're not covering the water column the way you should be. You know, and I, generally, I come up to about halfway in the water column uh, during daylight hours. Uh, one thing, if you're fishing at night for the walleyes, keep in mind that they will come into very shallow water at night. And a lot of people think of walleyes as deep water fish. Uh, almost all my walleyes at night come in water that's less than eight feet deep. And I caught them in water that's where, I mean, it's, my minnow is literally this far below the tip up in three feet of water. I miss anything on the tip ups? Not at the moment. Okay. What about trout, Bob? Trout. I think if I was, I don't really fish for trout a whole lot. Uh, if I was going to fish for trout, I would jig for them. The way these guys do, I think it's more productive than setting tip ups out. I know, you know, when they get freshly stocked, guys will go out and put a ball of power bait under the tip up. That seems to be the standard, the standard thing. I think that works great for a couple days or a week. Uh, I think after that, then you're better off jigging for them. With small jigs and the wax worms or plastics, with jigging or paddles like they were talking about. Uh, one thing with chow is chow are another one of the fish that will use the entire water column. You know, a lot of times, you know, especially if you're going to run tip ups for chow, you know, put a four pound test leader on there, use a small hook, and run a little fat head minnow. But make sure you have at least one where it's set literally <coughs> a foot below the ice, even if you're in 30 feet of water. A lot of times, chow will cruise along right under the ice, sucking up dead insects that floated up and got trapped under the ice. So if you ever use an underwater camera, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, you can turn it <clears throat> so it's viewing up. You can actually see all these little dead insects that are stuck up under the ice. Chop feet on that. We are going to do a little question and answer thing at the end here. you. My favorite topic, mm -hmm. flashers. How many of you own a flasher? Whether it be Markham, Vexilar, <laughs> not many of you. Or are you guys missing out? <laughs> All right. Um, a flasher shows everything in real time. If you move your jig, it shows on here. If a fish shows up, it shows on here. If there's anything under your hole, it sees it. It shows everything from below the ice to the bottom of the lake. Anything that comes within the cone of this transducer, you can see it. And I will show you. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. 
there'll be a, you can see a flicker. But you see a flicker, down you see a line moving. Oops. Can anybody see it? Nobody see it? See, I'm moving it up and down. You have the sensitivity up and down? I do have the sensitivity up. It's all the way up. But one of the problems demonstrating it like this, this cone needs to be in the water. It holds and focuses the signal so it goes straight down. When it's out in the open air, it will just bounce around. But the point is, if you can see this line moving, it's not working. Okay. Well, that was a bust. Be about three times how high you're holding it above the ground. Well, I understand yeah. that. I understand that. We've we've done this uh, several times where it's it's worked, but it's hit or miss. But anyway, it's real time. Everything that comes into the cone angle, whether it be fish, sticks, rocks, uh, you can see it. Generally, hard stuff, sticks, rocks rock bottom will show up the bottom signal is a hard red line if it's weeds you'll see a soft green line the signal deadens on that soft material it doesn't give a good signal back but uh, when you when you go out on the ice or, or when I go out on the ice I have my Bexelar with me if I don't have it I'll go buy it back home and get it if I'm far away from home on a tournament, I'll go out and buy another one. Not that my wife loves it, but um, she uh, hates it sometimes how I, I am. But anyway, um, when, when you've got the money and you want to make a purchase, an electronic purchase, and we're going to talk about cameras here in a second, but this is by far your first purchase. Do not opt for the camera because you can watch the fish or whatever. You're really restricted in what you can see and how you can see it. Uh, the Bachelor gives you the everything below the ice and makes you a better fisherman hands down because when you're fishing a hole and you look down that hole, you don't see anything. But when you drop your jig down, I don't care if it's one one hundredth of an ounce, when you drop it down, you'll see that jig fall all the way to the bottom if you let it. But when you stop it and you jig, you can see that jig move. If you change, if you set the settings, the sensitivity on this, if you do it properly, you can actually see if you're using plastics or bait, you can watch the, the bait flicker. It's it's only lines, but after watching it a while, you learn to interpret what's going on. And you can actually see when you're jigging that that tail or the bait just flicker faintly on either side of the line. When a fish comes up and hits, grabs bait and you miss the fish, and you're down there jigging, you're wondering why. Look for that faint wiggle. If you don't see that faint label, your, your hook is clean. There's not any bait on it. So, um, invaluable tool for fishing. Uh, when we do competitive fishing, uh, we've kind of modified the, the vexes to fit on buckets. This allows us to whole hop and fish fast. The, uh, you just set it down right in the hole, transducer falls, have it right here, drop it in the hole, you're good to go. You're jigging, not catching a fish in a minute, next hole over, you're back down again fishing. Real quick, real easy to make. They sell commercial versions of this called a hole hopper. Hole hopper. And by Sportsman's Direct. By Sportsman's Direct. You put, uh, Doing it this way, really, uh, we fish all over Pennsylvania, and I guarantee you if we hit a lake, 
were probably the only two on a bucket, pole hopping, and everybody else is sitting in their holes watching their um, ugly tip-ups that uh, <laughs> some people like to fish with. So, um, anyway, we'll be catching fish. People like him won't be catching anything, or very few. So, I mentioned cameras. Cameras are a good tool to have. But, again, for your first purchase, the Bexlar is the way to go. Cameras are good if you're sitting in a shanty, wanting to just watch fish, sitting on tip-ups and want, whoa, sorry. Anyway, um, they're good for seeing what is actually under the water. If you're, drop it down, you can see the weeds, you can see the fish in the weeds, you know the species of fish that's hiding in the weed. You can down view with these and watch your jig. As uh, Byron mentioned, you can rig it for up viewing. But one of the things I like to do if I'm fishing with the camera, uh, I'm not very proficient with perch. One of the things I like to do is put the camera in a down view mode set it about two to three feet depending on water clarity which is one of the downsides to a camera if the water is dirty you can't see anything but when it's clear set this two to three feet above your jig and then you can watch your jig you can watch it dance you can watch the fish come to your bait you can watch them neutral negative positive move obviously when it's positive they're biting but when you have it like this it keeps it out of the way and doesn't interfere with fish one of the things i see people do with a camera drop it down in a hole let it sit horizontally and watch their jig and their jig is right it's right here so they can see it okay you're jigging it little fish comes up looks at the jig and wants to bite but he sees this big fish and scrams you know uh, this somewhat natural it depends on the species of fish i notice drop it down bluegill will come up to this and kind of say hey pal what's up kind of watch it and hang out with it northern pike on the other hand will smash it and chew on it um, there's teeth marks in this one but it's uh, it's a good tool it's a fun tool what we do with the cameras on tournament lakes that we've not been to we'll do the research at home which we'll get into later but we'll, we'll drill a lot of holes drop the camera down do a quick spin around just spin the cable and take a look around and see what's under the water. Um, typically, like Mike had stated, we're panfish fishermen. So we're looking for gills, crappie, perch, to see, you know, it helps you determine size, the species, and so on. So when we see fish, you don't always want to stick them pre-fish in a tournament use the camera to kind of, kind of identify what's under the water, who's home, who's not, and make, for from a tournament perspective, an assessment of worthiness for the, for the bucket. So, whoops, don't drop them. They're not, not very good for them. So, again, a good tool, tournament fishing, good for entertaining kids, not very uh, efficient for catching fish uh, if you're doing it in a horizontal position. The, uh, you only are restricted to where the camera is at. So if you're down here at the bottom, foot off the bottom watching the fish, and you got crappies flying in high above, you're not seeing them. That's why you want the Vexilar, so you can see everything, top to bottom. 
So, don't you need a second hole as well for the camera? And one? No, no, fish no. Fish out of the same hole. Fish out of the same hole. Uh, it's a little tricky if you hook a bluegill since they do circles all the time when they're hooked. Uh, how many catch bluegills? Everybody's caught bluegill and know that they spin around in a circle. Well, when they do, they'll wrap up the cable. Sometimes. Uh, generally, they'll go one way, get tight, and on occasion they'll unwrap themselves. On other occasions, they'll unhook themselves. But overall, you can fish in the same hole with the camera and not have any issues. All right. And they get off. talk a little bit about uh, shelters. Um, one of the best things that a shelter is for is to protect you from the elements. If you're out there and you have some rain or sleet or even snow, um, you can get out of the weather for a while because there's nothing more miserable than being out there and getting wet and uh, getting cold. So this, this will help protect you from the elements. And another good thing is they're excellent wind breaks. You know, it gets windy out there, and sometimes uh, that wind gets annoying, especially when you're using light line and light jigs. If you get a good stiff wind going, it's, it's kind of hard. You're, the hole's right there, and you're dropping your jig, but it's landing over here because the wind goes over there. If you can get inside the shelter and close it up, you can, uh, you can fish pretty good. But here we have Clam offers all kinds of different styles of shelters. They have uh, cabin style sh shelters, uh, pop-up shelters, and the fish trap, which is what this is. This is a one-man fish trap. Uh, it's built on a sled base, so you can take your gear, your Vexilar, your fishing rods, um, your bucket, you can put everything inside of this and pull it around with you. The way it works is it just has a little seat on it. You pull it over to the hole that you have drilled. You sit in it like this. You flip over. And you're fishing. You're done with this hole. You flip it back over. You grab the rope. You pull it to the next hole. You sit in it. Flip it over. You're fishing. It's kind of like the idea that we use with the bucket, where you just use the bucket, go to the holes, hop on them, and, and start fishing. But this will help protect you from the elements, like I mentioned. Uh, they do also make larger styles of the flip-over type shelters. Um, you have the Nanook, the Yukon, the Denali II, which are designed for two fishermen. They have seats that are usually side by side, or in the case of the Denali, they're kind of back to back. But they are still the flip over style. Um, and so they are very portable. And that's, that's the idea of that, is to be able to move and run and gun like we like to do, have a string of 10 holes, and just go bam, 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 and, and hit those holes as quick as we can sometimes, depending on the fish and how well they're biting. Uh, they make four-person shelters, like the Denali 4 and the X4, they're designed for four fishermen where you have two seats on each side, you're back to back, there's plenty of room in them. Um, but then again, they are bigger and bulkier, so uh, it's a little tougher to move them around than it would be for the for a scout, which is what that model is right there, the smaller single person type. Uh, the Clam 2000 is a suitcase type shelter. It's, it, it closes down, I don't know how high it is, maybe about 10 inches thick. And it just lays flat and what you can do is pile your gear on top of it and grab the rope and you pull that along with you. And the way it works is just like a suitcase. It's in two halves. You get to where you want to fish, you just <coughs> unfold it like that. The canvas goes up, you put the poles in. And the advantage to that is now, you, when you get inside of it, you have a floor to stand on. So you're not standing in the snow, you're not standing on the ice, you're not standing in the slush. And it does have holes in the floor. There's actually just 
some removable covers on the floor that you take out, you drill your holes, and you can stand in there and fish. Um, the nice thing about those is that they're fairly portable too because once you have it all set up and you want to drill a, or drill some other holes and go fish over there, you can just grab that rope and pull it all set up just like it is. So that's, that's another good thing about it. Uh, the pop-up type portables is what you see here. Um, <clears throat> they don't have any kind of uh, a floor system or anything in them. Um, the advantage to those is they're more compact. They'll, they'll fold down and roll up and actually fit into like a duffel bag type of thing. Uh, not as big as a big duffel bag, but uh, in a bag that you can uh, carry on your back instead of having to drag anything along with you. Um, the disadvantage to th this type is that you, you have to be sure to anchor it because there's no floor to where you have this, this type of shelter or the suitcase type where your weight, you're the anchor keeping that in place if it's a windy day. Something like that, you don't have a floor in it, so if it's a windy day, even if it's not, you should have it anchored just in case that just the wind comes through. Um, and, and that makes these less less portable than either the suitcase style or a, a sled style like that. A lot of times fishermen will go out in groups and some of them will have that type of shelter, the bigger type of shelter there. It's, uh, and Clam makes what's called a, a base camp or command post. Uh, and that can fit four to six fishermen in there. You can get in there and you can drill your holes and fish out of there, or what a lot of guys do if they go out in a group, they'll set up one of these command posts, they'll have a heater or two in there, maybe a table, and then they'll, have, they'll each have their own single sled. And they'll go off and do their fishing, and if they want to come back and warm up, you can get inside there and, and take a break, warm up, eat some lunch, or, you know, of course you're going to tell fish stories about the one that got away right over there. You know, where it's a, the 10 inch crappie is, is, it's 16 inches once it gets away. But you know how that goes. Um, they, there's a ton of accessories that they have to go with these shelters. Uh, almost every model comes with a thermal cover, where it's a heavier, like a quilted cover that will help hold the heat in more than the regular cover up, even though, although these do an excellent job of holding the heat in. If I sit in one of these, even without a heater, and I'm closed up for 10, 15 minutes, I'm taking my coat off because it, it's getting hot in there. You know, it, and um, another accessory that's nice is the travel cover. With, that's just a, I don't know where the cover is for this, but it just fits over top of the whole thing and kind of keeps all of your gear and keeps anything from blowing out while you're moving around. Uh, runner kits go on the bottom to help protect the bottom of the sled from being worn. Where on the ice, you don't have to worry about it so much, but it's when you're dragging it through the parking lot, getting to the ice and dragging it off, things like that, where you want to try to protect the bottom of that, the sled. Uh, they make a tow hitch. Because in, in some states, you're allowed to use quads and snowmobiles on the ice to drive around on some of these real big lakes. Uh, what's nice about that is it attaches to your sled. You just hook the tow hitch onto the back of your snowmobile or quad and just fly across the ice like that. Um, they make storage bags, organizers with pockets to keep all of your gear in and, and they can stay attached to the pole so when you open and close it, uh, it kind of keeps everything together. Because one thing you don't want to do is get everything tangled up in there, especially your rods. A good rod lock is a good thing to have. Because if you have four or five rods in there and you try to put them, just lay them in there and you're moving around, next thing you know, everything's twisted up and you're cutting lines and retying. It gets to be a mess. Uh, they make these nifty little lights. LED, very bright to hang inside. If you're closed up in there, you can hang this above you or on the side and it's just a quick click to to retie or whatever you need to do in there. And they also make a light fan combination where if you're in a shelter and you have a heater, 
you have the light, of course, so you can see, but the fan helps circulate the heat and keep things even in there. Um, and that's about it for shelters. And another piece of equipment that I alluded to briefly there was the outer garments and the clothing. And I think Clam makes some of the best outer garments on the market, and Bob's going to talk about them a little bit. Yes, um, I have to assume that everybody knows how to dress. <laughs> you all made it here with clothes on your backs, correct? But how many actually know how to dress properly for winter conditions? Dressing with a base layer, moving on up to heavier stuff. I want to talk a little bit for those who are just getting into ice fishing and wanting to know how to dress for the ice. We'll start at the feet. A, what I put on my feet, a wicking sock and a heavy sock. A wool or some synthetic that is out there. They're all warm, they are all very effective. But the purpose of a wicking sock is to wick moisture away from your foot. If your foot is dry, it is warm. When, when it pulls that moisture away from your foot, it puts it into that outer sock, that heavier sock, absorbs into that, and you don't feel any ill effects from that. Uh, a good thermal underwear is, uh, is a bonus. Ice Armor produces a base layer that is fleece lined and wicks. Same, re same purpose as the wicking sock. That garment, which is two piece, pant and top, will wick moisture away because when you're walking, dragging a sled and all your gear, which you'll find out, you always end up with too much stuff in the sled and you work up a lather. That'll help dry you off. It'll pull that moisture away from your skin and help keep you warm. On top of that, I just wear a pair of jeans, a sweatshirt, hooded sweatshirt on windy days. Uh, that you pull it up over your head, protects your neck, especially if you wear short hair. There's nothing to protect your neck. So um, keeping your neck from chilling, there's also neck gaiters you can put on. After that, I may, on super cold days like this past weekend in western Pennsylvania, temperatures were sub-zero. The only thing I did, I added a fleece pullover top, and then I put my outer garments on, my bibs and, and my jacket, and I was fine. The reason I was fine, Ice Armor products, the outer garment is windproof, waterproof. They're somewhat expensive. Uh, you could get the retail to a couple hundred, maybe 300 bucks for the whole set. But if you're not in the market for a high price suit, anything that is windproof, waterproof is paramount when you're out there. Because if the wind is blowing through your car heart, I know a lot of people like to wear their car hearts. If the wind is blowing through there, it's taking heat away from your body and you will get chilled and ruin your time on the ice. So windproof, waterproof, paramount. Get that. Then uh, for hands, again with ice armor, but again, not necessary for the brand name. Anything that is windproof and waterproof is great. Um, one of the things that I like is a windproof, but not waterproof, knit glove. It has a windproof liner in it that um, helps keep your hands warm, but they're easier to slip on, especially when your hands are cold. I typically don't fish with gloves on, only because I feel the rod, I can keep in contact with the rod much better. Plus, when a fish gets off at the hole, I can dive in the water and get it. You know, if I soak the glove, it's great. But like this weekend, it was sub-zero temperatures. While this is windproof, waterproof, the outer layer of this glove 
or any glove for that matter, will absorb some water. It won't get to your hand, but it will absorb water. And when it's sub-zero, these will freeze solid. So you cannot work with the glove at all. So other than that, the boot, a good waterproof boot, warm pack boot is good. Um, these are ice armor boots again. Real nice waterproof boot, very flexible upper, good solid bottom. It helps, gives you a little bit of flex for traction, but a, and a thick bottom sole. But again, you don't need to buy the brand name. You can get uh, <coughs> other boots out there, other manufacturers out there, lacrosse, Rocky, any of those make great boots. You know, so you want something that's <coughs> waterproof and warm. Uh, everybody varies with regard to grams, thickness, insulation, you know, 1,000 grams or 800 grams might work for some, 2,000 grams may work for others. I'm on the 2,000 gram side, <laughs> okay? My feet freeze. When you dress, do not have any binding points, i.e. under your arms where the clothing is tight. You don't want to be restricted anywhere because it will cut flow off to your extremities. A lot of people lace up their boots, pull them super tight, and wonder why their feet still get cold with everything that I told you to get. Leave the laces loose. Like tie them in a knot, obviously, so you don't trip over them, but leave them loose so the blood can flow in and out of your feet all the way to your toes and back out again. So, have I insulted enough people to intelligence? <laughs> I apologize. But some people just don't get it. Huh? So, anyway, we're moving on to fishing strategies. You've been dressed up now, you've been equipped with electronics, safety, you know everything that you need to know to go on the ice, except where to fish, right? So, when you go out there, before you get out there, do some research at home. I told you before, this is your best tool for ice fishing. Get out online, learn where the fish are biting, get fishing reports, so on and so forth for that. If you're targeting specific species, crappy are my favorite by far. Best fish to catch. Know what they do, where they live, what haunts they go to. Uh, if they're structure in the water, they relate to all that stuff. Um, you can consult the Fish and Boat Commission and get opportunities booklets that give you guidelines to different lakes, species of fish, different regions. So pick these up that are outside. Also, uh, back to Mike's real quick, there are also catalogs and stuff out on that table for anybody who needs or wants to view anything that we're talking about. All right, Mike will take you further into the fishing strategies, including contour maps and fishing. Okay, um, one thing you want, especially when you're going to a new lake, is a detailed map, the detail that you can get to show you different structures in the lake, contours, um, weed beds, weed lines, any, anywhere that you could find the type of fish that you're fishing for. I had to justify bringing my laser pointer so I have to use it. So, as you can see, any, any kind of contour lines you see that are close together indicate a steep drop off. Any areas like that where you see the contour lines are spread apart. That's a, a large, flat type area. And depending on the species of fish that you're looking for, uh, 
will dictate the type of uh, areas that you're looking to fish. As Bob mentioned, uh, crappie's our favorite. That's why we started the Keystone Crappie Association. So well, that, that's usually our target species whenever we're going to the lake. And being tournament fishermen, the crappie tend to be the heavier fish of the panfish that we go for, between bluegill perch and, and the crappie. Which is, that's another reason why we target them. Uh, one thing I had alluded to a little bit before was to make sure, when I was talking about jigging, is to make sure you work the entire water column. So, and what I mean by that is, as soon as your jig touches the water, you should be jigging and working it down. Work it down until your rod tips almost down to the water, let out some more line, and continue to work it. And make sure that you work an entire water column because just because you're not seeing fish on your electronics doesn't mean that they're sitting out there up right outside of the cone of your flasher unit. So if you work that jig down in a natural motion, that could bring those fish in. If that jig just plummets to the bottom, that's not natural. Fish don't see, you know, their bait just dive, dive bomb to the bottom and pop back up. So that's a very important concept. Even though your screen is empty, work that entire water column. I guess I beat that enough. And another thing is to be mobile, which is what we talked about with our run and gun type strategy. Where we drill a string of holes and we fish the hole until we determine that there are no fish there or the fish that are there aren't biting anymore. Um, and especially in tournaments, if you can get to the spots where the fish are, you, you tend to catch the bigger fish, the more aggressive fish right off the bat, because that, that bait's working down there. The dominant fish will come in and grab it before the other ones do, most of the time. So you want to make sure that you're, that you're mobile and you're moving. Um, and that will, I'll turn it over to mm -hmm. Byron. The most important thing, I hope, and we really didn't stress it a whole lot, but the very most important <laughs> thing was the very last thing Mike talked about. That's something every ice fisherman should always know is mobility. Keep moving. If you're not catching fish, move. You want to take your boat out in the middle of the lake, anchor, and fish for three hours without catching any fish, you move your boat. You go out to drill a hole, you fish for five minutes, if you're not catching fish, move. I think that's most of that, That's the secret, is move constantly. We're going to get it, we are going to get into questions and answers here in a second. Uh, before we do, I thank the Fish Commission earlier for having us. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the Fish Commission. I am lucky enough that I have been able to fish in just about every state in this country and a good bit of Europe to do. Uh, and I can tell you that there is no state in the United States that offers the variety and quality of fishing that Pennsylvania has. You know, Texas might have bigger largemouth bass, but they don't have smallmouth bass. Montana, Wyoming might have better chop fishing, but they don't have crappy fishing. And if you go down to and look at our state records, you can compare them to any other state out there. And not only that, but we have a ton of public access in Pennsylvania. We're really blessed. I think a lot of people that don't travel a lot don't realize. I hear a lot of people complaining they don't stock enough trout. They stock too many trout. The trout are too small. I wish they'd stock bluegills, which they do. Uh, but, you know, so if you doubt me, get on the internet, get on the website, do a little bit of research, because we really are lucky to have what we have here in Pennsylvania. You know, right here, within 20 minute drive of here, you've got some really outstanding fishing, you know. Uh, so keep that in mind, and now I think we're going to, you want to, any questions, if anybody has any? No one talked about sunlight versus shade. When you're out there in a structure fishing, that makes a shadow on a sunny day, and you also get shadows from snow patches versus clear ice. Is there any strategy you use to do the fish I, tend to go to the shade or the sunny or? I, I know a guy that does very well fishing tournaments who actually shovels snow in on clear ice that doesn't have any snow on sunny days to make a shade area. Because the fish will often lay in the shade and swim out into the sunlight to grab a bait and they'll fish right on that shade line. Uh, that's one of the many things we did not cover. It does work sometimes. One of the big problems is you have snow here, you're in 20 feet of water, you have a snow spot here, the sun's over here. You have to figure out where that shade is over here. 
You know, it works great in theory when the sun's straight up above you. Uh, and again, if you know if the whole lake is covered with snow, it might pay to shovel some snow off. Uh, I, to me, that's almost too much work. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really is. I, I shovel snow at the house. I don't want to be out. <laughs> But I would certainly never say it doesn't work. On, on the flip side of that, however, if there's no snow on the ice and you take a shelter out and create a shade spot, that kind of spooks the fish in contrast to what, you know, the shade, natural shade patches do. But I've, I've experienced it on tournament lakes where you know fish are there. You know, you see them on your transducer, whatever. As soon as you slide that shack over there, it could be part because you're sliding the shack, but I know when you close that off, the fish stay away from that shadow. It's an unnatural thing to them because of no snow. Question up here. <coughs> Question for Byron. Yes, sir. I like to know what your approach is from like the beginning of ice and then when you get into midwinter. After the, after the ice has been around for about two months, you know, we usually get clear ice at the beginning, and it becomes snow covered, kind of foggy after a month or so. Early early ice, early in the season when you first get ice, my number one rule of thumb is to have your green leaves. Uh, any large cove or bay, usually in Pennsylvania, you have leaves going out to about somewhere around 10 foot or so, depending on the clarity. I look for green leaves early in the season. Uh, as the season progresses, you get more ice, you get some snow on top of the ice, what happens is the sunlight isn't getting through to the weeds, the weeds start to die off. When the weeds are still green early in the year, they're producing oxygen. Fish need oxygen. All the things that fish eat need oxygen. Later in the season, as the weeds start to die off, they're actually consuming oxygen. And thus the fish will move out of the shallow weedy areas and uh, move down into the next deepest spot. So usually mid-season to late season, I will look for the closest deep water to where the weeds are. You know, if the weeds are coming down to 10 feet of water and then it drops off a little bit, goes down to 15, 20 feet, that's where I'll, look. I'll concentrate more on the basin area. And then at the very end of the ice fishing season, you get snow melting, comes down in little streams, come into the lake, that pushes fresh oxygen in, and a lot of fish will come back up into the shallow areas late the season. Can I ask one more question? If you're fishing tip ups for walleye, how long will you fish tip up in certain holes before you move on? An hour. Other than an hour. But you know, walleyes, especially during the dusk and night hours, walleyes will cruise a lot. You know, so I might, you know, I might camp out and stay in an area that's an area that I have faith in. Uh, area I have faith in is a shallow area. It's near deep water. They tend to spend their day down in deep water, especially in like staying in the creek channel, you can get a map of the lake that shows where the creek channel is. They're going to spend a day down in the deeper water, and then in the evening they're going to move up into the shallow water. And do you find that to be true regardless if it's week-old ice or two-month-old ice? Pretty much so, yes. yes. And if, you, if you're going to try night fishing for walleyes, keep your bait up high. So the walleyes will swim along, and your bait will actually be silhouetted against the ice. Because there is a little bit of moonlight out there, stars and stuff, even on the darkest nights. And again, if you have a look around the underwater camera looking up at the ice, you'll see that it's actually fairly bright. You wouldn't think it would be, but it is. And your minnow will be silhouetted against that ice. Thank you. Yes, sir. During your tournament fishing, uh, do you, ever, you guys ever use tandem lures, like uh, maybe two feet above uh, the bottom or? So, sometimes we do. Like you know, up in Michigan, we discovered that uh, in some of the, those clear water lakes that we fish, uh, we actually you will have a jig on the bottom and what, about 18 inches up or so we have a like a, a fly actually um, just an inch or less coming off of the main line just a little like a little tag end of the line that we tie it on to um, and the purpose of that is if, if the jig on the bottom isn't attracting the fish a lot of times that little fly as you're jigging your jig's going to move more aggressively, but that fly and that little tag end is just going to just going to do one of these. It's just going to kind of sway back and forth. And I've actually seen sight fishing on these clear lakes. If you get in in your shack, close it up, and look down the hole, give your eyes a few minutes to adjust. You can you can see bottom in sometimes up to 20 feet of water 
in some of these lakes. But you can watch, and I've, I've seen the big red ears, or, or pumpkin seeds, that we call them, but they call them red ear shell crackers out there. I, I've seen them come in at the jig and kind of hesitate, and all of a sudden they angle up because they see that little, that little fly up there. And sometimes that's more attractive, and they'll come up and bite that. So, um, but that's the only type of, of tandem rigging that, that I've done. May I, Mike? Sure. Uh, for a uh, I stated earlier that they won our tournament last week on Beachwood Lake. The team that came in second last week, I know the guy, his name's Fred Janik, and I've been fishing with him for about 10 years, and not one single time have I ever seen him fish anything other than two ice jigs a foot apart on the same line. I mean, every single rod he has on tournament day, and whether he's fishing in a tournament or for fun, has two ice jigs, both tied on the same line. So, I think it's, you know, a matter Last of personal season. preference a lot. Guys Last do it. Yep. Yes, sir. Do you ever have any problems, like, with the, the different types of wire, like, versus non-braid, where it's not so abrasion resistant? Like, when you're fighting the fish, if it goes to the side and rubs against the ice, Anything? Does that ever cut or? I don't. I don't think enough that it's noticeable. I mean, we, we lose some fish once in a while, uh, and I think most both of us or all of us actually, you know, we're jigging our fishing almost exclusively two pound test line, uh, and it's you know ice really isn't that sharp. Uh, it's little clusters of ice around you hold that your line gets stuck on. Sometimes it can cause problems. But uh, I think we, you know, all three of us are using monofilament of one type or another. I don't think any of us are using super lines like Power Pro or any of the braided lines or anything like that. You mentioned uh, the jigs that when you pause the line, sometimes they go to spin. Have you ever used a barrel swivel above it a foot or so, two foot above, to reduce that spin? Or no, I never have. Um, because a lot of the jigs we use are so small, I don't think that would make much of a difference that it would absorb that, that twisting motion. Um, and then again, I, d I don't want to have anything else on the line that's going to spook the fish, more or less. Because um, they're, they're very skittish sometimes, especially, like I said, the bigger fish. If something looks out of the ordinary, um, you know, they, they'll tend to shy away from it. Now, I've had little bluegill come in, look at the jig, and go up and, and bite a split shot if I have one. So, you know, in some cases it will attract some fish, but uh, to be honest, I, I don't know if that would actually... Uh, if you watch it maybe on the camera, you know if it's working or not. Right, right. I, I've, I've actually never, never tried that. Have you? No, I've never put it on. can't put a hook on a barefoot swivel. It seems uh, in freshwater I've used the swivel and more often than not that gets hit before my bait does. <laughs> so um, until you figure out how to put a hook on it, I'll take my chances with the spinning. It's um, like Mike said earlier, you know, you keep it moving even slightly, that will stop the spin. Um, <clears throat> fishing those shuli reels will help stop twist in the line. So that's the whole key. Whenever you're out on a day fishing, it helps if you unspool some of your line. Take the jig off of it, then wind it up again on the back onto the spool with your fingers lightly <coughs> pressed against the line. That'll help work any twist out. Uh, if you're open water fishing, opening the bail up and letting the line trail out behind the boat as you're moving forward will untwist the line. But uh, in this case, you have to do it with your fingers and to untwist the line. Because if it gets wrapped too tight, it actually uh, causes problems with the strength of the line. Because it'll twist and stretch at the same time. So the next hook set. Any more questions? Fluorocarbon. Good stuff. Clear, wet, clear water. Uh, as in ice fishing, the fluorocarbon, the fish can't see it. You can use a little bit heavier line, 
and get away with it. You know, we say we don't use anything heavier than four pound test. With fluorocarbon, you could go up to six or eight pound if you wanted to. Although at eight pound, you're pushing it, but you could go up to six pound and not have a problem spooking uh, panfish. The stiffness of the line is sometimes in peace and why I go to lighter line. It, it does. That is true. Um, ice fishing line, there's so much of it out there. You really got to experiment and find which line works best for you. Some are stiffer, some are more supple, but it's, it's personal preference and if you got a shop. You, you, there's really no best line for you that I can say. You can go out, you got to go out and experiment. Back. Yes. When you were talking about braids, I remember you saying that you use braid, uh, like the floating braid as opposed to the uh, new Flora braid, you know, the sinking models. I'm sorry. I, when I say braid, what I, was, I wasn't really talking about like the new super braids that are out, like Power Pro and stuff like that. I was talking about braided Dacron line. Uh, uh, and I probably didn't clarify that, but it's the oldest fishing line there was. Probably nobody in here, but if you're really old, you remember when this was all there was before there was monofilaments, when you put on your bait caster reels and made a terrible mess when you got a backlash. Uh, but it's a lot of places like the seller will just call it tip up line, but it's braided and Dacron line is what it is. But it is, it is not anything at all like a super line, it's not in diameter or anything like that. All right, okay. uh, one thing when we were up in New York one year, uh, a couple years back, guy uses Power Pro. He was swearing up and down how good Power Pro is. And I use Power Pro on my open water rods, but for ice fishing, he swore that it was the greatest stuff. When he started jigging, he actually hooked a pipe, came in on his little panfish rod, and he had that uh, Power Pro on there. And it was great to watch. However, when that fish took off and shot under the ice, the braid acted like a saw and sliced through the ice. It was incredible to watch. However, the fish got out so far and that line cut so far into the ice that it eventually stopped. The angle was such that it bound the line. The line didn't break, but the fish used the fact that that line got caught as leverage and pulled the hook out so um, it's good it's bad but um, I love it for open water yeah get a lot of my jigs back yes I'll think it was the ice of beechwood <laughs> beechwood 10 inches it was 10, 10 inches 10 inches, 10 inches with uh, Ten inches. snow cones okay. met it up that way oh, okay well, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Good. I was going to say it's getting late, and uh, you've really been a patient crowd. Right. And um, I'd really like uh, let's give um, Mike, Bob, and Darn. <laughs> I'm sure they'd be willing to stick around, give you a hands-on demo of some of their equipment. Uh, I sure wish that state record crappy. It should have been able to show up on the screen earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but uh, I, I, uh, we're re really appreciative of you coming in, and uh, hopefully have, we'll have some fishing seminars for you in the future, too. So, thanks again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody.